Machiavellian is a word that means sneaky. It's about politicians who use subterfuge to get what they want. Um, but the name comes from a great man, Niccolò Machiavelli. He was one of the first people to really start thinking about power and thinking about how power is gained, how we maintain it, and how it can be lost. He started thinking not just about the rights of kings to rule, but about how different people come to power and what they can do to keep it. And his seminal book is called The Prince. Princes being unelected rulers of the nation states that he lived amongst. And so that's how this word Machiavellian came about. He was giving them advice on how to keep people in check. These days, we all study power and politics. We, we learn about it in schools, even. And so it's, of course, very useful to think about what is that power those politics that we're learning about. In our current society, only about 70% of people vote in a general election. In a local election, that goes down to about 40%. And voting is probably the smallest engagement you can have with politics. And if we're honest, most of us vote to give away power and give away responsibility rather than to take hold of it rather than to say, this is me asking you to work on my behalf, but to say, go off and deal with that stuff because I can't be bothered. It's too complicated. So if you wanted to challenge that situation, what would you do? I'll come back to that in a second. And where does this get us? Where does this disengagement get us? Well, it gets us to a situation where... If we take David Cameron's first cabinet as an interesting case in point, 80% of that cabinet were millionaires, where all bar one of them were white. Almost all of them were male. In fact, with, were Saeed Atavasi to leave, as she eventually did, she knocked out both the ethnic minority component and a third of the women, a quarter of the women. So. We're in this situation where we have a very small group of people who are embedded as a new elite, potentially our new princes. What's the problem with this? Well, you might say, well, those people who are successful in business, maybe they, it's a good idea to have them helping run the country. But, of course, these people weren't just millionaires. 53% of them had been to expensive private schools. So maybe that wasn't so much success as inherited kind of wealth and social capital. What's the problem with this? Well, I'm going to just take you on a little detour about another Italian. No one quite as uh, laudable as Machiavelli. Uh, actually, Il Duce, the fascist dictator Mussolini. It was said about Mussolini that at least he made the trains run on time. Democracy is this messy, kind of chaotic thing, and it makes things go wrong, but you get somebody in charge who knows what they're doing, has an absolute power, and you can make the trains run on time. And this is a very interesting critique of democracy, but it turns out not to be true. Other people looked at this, and they, and they examined the data. Were the trains more efficient, more on time, under Mussolini, than prior or after, and it turns out they weren't. So why, why, why did this come about? Why did people think that they were? Well, of course, because you're not allowed to complain. If you're in a totalitarian dictatorship, you don't complain about the trains being late. And what did this mean in Italy? Well, it meant that actually, when the war started and they needed to bring in coal using the rail network, the rail network was terrible because Mussolini didn't have anyone in charge of it, because everybody kept telling him the trains were great. This is where democracy comes in. It might not be the quickest way to run a country or run any system, but it is the most efficient, because we gather all the data. 
If people are willing to complain about the trains being late, then hopefully they're also willing to complain about much more important things like injustice, inequality, corruption. And when we gather in all those pieces of data of people saying this is wrong and also saying, and I have an idea of how to fix it, that's when we create a much more efficient system. Efficiency isn't about doing things quickly. Efficiency is about doing things well for the greatest number of people. So we have this system in our country where fewer and fewer people are being listened to, where fewer and fewer people are engaging at the high levels of politics. If you were one of those people, one of those new princes, eager to maintain that system, what would you put in place? Maybe you would say, this has worked quite well for me. Let's copy it and miniaturize it and give that to our young people to play around with. And that's actually what happens, I think, in most schools in this country. 95% of schools have a school council. If you went to school in the last 10 years, that probably was your first brush with democracy. If you've got kids at school now, 1% of you, your kid might be on the school council. The other 99%, they're not. So what's the problem here? We've developed a system which narrows and narrows those people who engage with politics. We've developed a system that mimics the routes that were taken by the people who are at the top and tells young people, this is the way you get on. So who ends up on there? You say, right, we've got a class of 30 of us. We need one or two of you to represent the others. So you better pick the kids who are good at talking. You better pick the kids who are good at developing an argument. You better pick the kids who get good grades because they might need to write something down. And if you don't pick the right kids, we'll help you out. We'll make sure that you have made the right choices. And so you say instantly to 28 kids in that class, we want to listen to all of you, but your only engagement is this. And then you leave it to them because they're the bright ones. And then we say to those kids, we want to hear all your ideas. But because we've only got 12 kids in our school of 1,200 that are working on this, we can't do most of them. And so we're encouraging young people to see politics as this game for bright, able kids who are bringing a lot of social capital. And we're encouraging the rest of the kids to say, this isn't something for you. You sit down, you wait your turn, you take your place. And so we've got these 12 kids and we think, right, these are great kids, they're a great example for the school, and we pat ourselves on the back for listening to them, and we pat the, them on the back for giving us the answers that we want. Because, of course, the kinds of kids who want to be in that situation and thrive in that situation are very much like the kinds of people that have set that situation up. And their views are very valid, they're very useful, but they will only tell you about things from their perspective. And we do this as well throughout society. Those of us who aren't in schools sit in board meetings, and if you'll excuse the, excuse the very cheesy pun, feeling bored, scrolling through our phones, checking emails from outside, and we think, how can we engage young people in, the, in our organization? Let's set up a youth board. Brilliant. I'm sitting here, not concentrating on what's going on, I want to get young people involved, so I'm going to get them to do the same thing as me. Hmm. Which people end up on those youth boards? Nine times out of ten, it's the same kids who are on the school council. They're kids who are good in those kind of situations. And as I said before, their opinions are very valid, and I come up with some fantastic ideas, but you're excluding all the rest of that information. You're excluding all the rest of those ideas, all the rest of those people who might complain about the trains not being on time and who might have a solution for how to make them run better. 
So what's the alternative? Well, a really interesting group that I came across in Tottenham called Haringey Young People Empowered. They were interested in improving the relationship between young people in Tottenham and Haringey and the police. Now, what they might have done is sat down with the police and had a big meeting, and I presume they probably did try that. And that would have got some really useful ideas aired by the kinds of people who like to sit down in meetings and air ideas. Quite possibly those who don't have the biggest problem with the police. So they took a different approach. They looked at what they were interested in. What were they interested in and what were the police interested in? And they set up an annual football tournament. And through this annual football tournament, what they do is they get young people from across the borough and beyond working and playing with the police officers to get the police as coaches, as referees, police playing in the, in the games, and they start to normalize relationships through something which is of interest to those young people who they want to work with, of interest to the adults they want to work with. Another example from a school that we've been doing some work with, and one of the students is here today, which is great, Joe Richardson Community School in Barking and Dagenham. They used to have a school council, and they had 12 kids out of 1,300 sitting on there. And those kids were developing some fantastic skills, but those kids already had quite a lot of fantastic skills. And they realized that this wasn't really what they were there for as a school. But what they wanted to do was to develop leadership in everybody. They wanted to teach everybody about how they could take some control of their society. Now, as a part of a slow process, they have 350 of their students actively involved in activities that they have designed, where they have identified the issue, they have identified the problem, and they are carrying out the solution. And these activities could be over anything at all. Some of them are doing incredibly important, worthy things, campaigning to get more women into schools around the world. Others really want to show people around the school. They're in the hospitality group. It's the most popular group. What they're learning through that is how to work together, how to collaborate, how to take action in their community, not how to be passive consumers of it, but to be the creators and conscious creators of the society and the structures that support it. So what do I recommend to you? Well, if you're in a school, get rid of your school council. Get rid of representation. Think about the structures that you want to create in the world and embed those in your school. When you're teaching English, you don't look outside and say, well, most people write really badly, and so we'll model that in our school. You look outside and you say, there's Shakespeare. Here is correct grammar. There's no grocer's apostrophes in our, in our school, and that's what we model. Do the same with politics and society. Don't look at models which don't work for us and copy them. Think about what you do best as a school. Aspire, teach, and inspire. Think about what is the society that we want to see? How can we model that in our school? And I would say that is through self-organizing groups of young people, and as schools like Joe Richardson can show, that those groups require very little staff support, and they engage a huge number of students in becoming creators of their community. If you're a young person, what do I recommend to you? Figure out what you're interested in, what your passion is. Demand from your schools and your youth organizations and your parents and your communities, support me to do this thing because it matters to me. It doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's setting up a Spurs supporters group, I would really recommend against that but setting up a Spurs supporters group, or, as happened at Joe Richardson, setting up an LGBT support group. What it is doesn't matter, because what you're learning is teamwork, collaboration, 
persuasion. You're learning to be an active controller of your society and your destiny. If you're a parent, I would recommend to you, when your kid comes home and says, we just had a school council election today, that you say, and what opportunities are open to the rest of you? That you demand from your schools and your youth organisations, how can my child become a leader in your school? How can my child become a leader in our community? And what support are you giving them to make that happen? If you're not in a school, a young person, or a parent, but you're, you're thinking, what's this got to do with me? And I would say to you, just the same, consider your community, consider the organisations that you represent, and think about how could you engage with young people as leaders, not as consumers of your product, or consumers of your service. Don't set up a youth board, talk to young people, give them the support to decide on the activities that matter to them, and how they will work with your organisation. You will be amazed at the kinds of things that they come up with. Now, I've spoken at length about young people, but this is not actually about young people. This is about society. It is about us not accepting that a society, a politics that doesn't work for the kind of society that we want to create, can be challenged. If we don't challenge it, all we do is perpetuate it. And we narrow further and further and further those group of people who are engaged at the, at the heart of our politics and the heart of our society. Machiavelli had a fantastic quote. He got a very bad name, but a lovely quote of his that I like. Where the willingness is great, the difficulties surely cannot be. Thank you. Thank you.